Hello, cinefans. I'm Kendall Kruver, and this is Watching Classic Movies. My guest, Alicia Malone, is a TCM host and the author of Backwards and Heels, The Past, Present, and Future of Women Working in Film, The Female Gaze, Essential Movies Made by Women, and her latest, Girls on Film, Lessons from a Life of Watching Women in Movies. We talked about her journey to embrace her authentic self, what she's focusing on next in her remarkable career, and how her perspective on film has grown and changed over years of movie fandom. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Kendall. Thanks for having me. And also thank you for your kind words about my book. I really appreciated your review. I, I do appreciate your writing. It's, it's a kind of writing that I believe is very difficult to do. I'm, I'm going to dip back on a review of Gilbert Grape, What's Eating Gilbert Grape from long ago, where a reviewer said that it went down like a milkshake, but it lingered like a claret wine. That's what I feel you do where, where I don't hold off on reading it. It's not, it's accessible, but um, I'm like thinking about it later on. I think about a lot of what's going in there. And this particular book, it was a mixture of cringe and joy for me. The cringe of remembering, like, saying jokes from All About Eve to my friends, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And the joy of escape, finding this wonderful thing and just going deeper and deeper into classics and movies in general. So I wanted to know, why did you decide to get personal with this book? Yeah, I wanted to challenge myself this time around. I see my three books as somewhat of a trilogy in that the first one is about film history. The second one's more about film analysis. And so I thought for the third book, I could combine a little bit of film history, a little bit of film analysis, and then bring in the element of a personal story. I've always written personal essays for myself and I've done several writing courses just in that genre, but I've been reticent to share it with the world. I've been sort of, uh, nervous about sharing my personal story and sharing a lot of myself because when I think about my job I'm always focused on telling stories about the film and not making myself front and center mm -hmm. and so but I thought that it would be interesting to investigate what a love of classic film has done for me throughout my life as we got into lockdown I noticed the types of films that I was gravitating towards for comfort and I wondered okay so how do I watch films why do I watch films what do I get from them and ultimately I realized that I I use them to ask myself more questions and prod myself towards more conversations than I do to find answers and originally going into the book I thought it was all about the fact that I find answers from films but that's not true and exactly what you say I, I try to write in a very accessible way I mean I'm not an academic so I don't know if I could write in that style if I tried <laughs> But I want to appeal to a wide audience to invite more people in to watch classic films and uh, do it in a way that's it's hopefully a little bit humorous and this time around that people can relate to my story. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I felt that. I really did. And I, I, I agree that I, I have wondered why classic films feel like home to me. Mm. And I think it is that a certain kind of classic film, some of them can go hard. But a certain kind of classic film really does give you that thing you mentioned about there being a solution at the end, the villains and the heroes being clear and and how you know that escape can help you to, to deal with reality a little bit. And I just thought it was interesting how you kind of unintentionally, it sounds like, created an image for yourself. Sort of like the film stars, and you know, and, and and it seemed in the book that you were not sure if that was such a good thing, but I wondered if creating an image has had a protective for, effect for you at all. Sort of like in watching those films, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I I devoured so many film books when I was young, and how they traps from regular everyday people into these Hollywood stars through a creation of a persona. And when I was young, I was so shy that I felt like I needed some be to where I wanted, didn't see myself as being someone that could be on camera and talking about films. Even though I had a love for them, I was just incredibly self-conscious. And so I, I transformed myself to another person in a way, or a different, bringing out different aspects of my personality. Uh, so I essentially created Alicia Malone, and that included changing my, changing my head, my style, 
trying to stand out, doing the sort of fake it till you make it confidence that I needed in order to be able to be on camera. And eventually real confidence caught up. I think when I was living in LA, I definitely started to lose myself a little bit because everyone is essentially doing that. They're creating themselves and trying to reach for the very infectious. When you first move there, it's exciting to be around that energy, but you can easily get lost in it and think, okay, I've got to be on social media. I've got to post selfies. I've got to yeah. have this image of myself. And so in the process of living in LA, I started to lose who I really was. Uh, but now I've come back to come back to her and, and reconcile the persona and the real personality. Did your move affect you coming back to yourself, like getting out of Hollywood? Yes, absolutely. I moved over to a small town on the East Coast where nobody cares what you do. Find my job in take, they're not uh, taken over by it, as in they're not trying to get anything out of me for it or they're not uh, starstruck by it. Yeah. So to be able to... Uh, where I could drop all those bells and whistles and just come back to who I really was. What am I like when I'm not wearing makeup all the time? What am I like here for function? And it's really about, do you have the right clothes to get through the weather <laughs> rather than are you wearing the latest trends? So in, a, in being able to strip myself that comes working in LA and, and living in Hollywood and seeing the same sort of beautiful person all the time, I was able to rediscover myself also by being quiet, you know, by not people's opinions on me all the time, um, being able to just read and reflect and walk mm -hmm. in the woods, that has helped me enormously as well. And now I feel like I have much more self-esteem and, and I feel self. this feels like who I really am. And that's been really valuable to come back to. So that's beautiful to hear. Uh, <laughs> so how has that changed your kind of your, your goals? for life and what, and what you want to do with your work going forward. I have done than I ever thought I would do and that I have achieved all my goals. In LA, it was very much about what's next, what's next, what are you doing next, what's your next project? And so I was never being the joy created. It was always about well, what, what are you pushing forward to? What are you moving forward to? Looking ahead. So it's been nice to be able to stay in the present and Everything that I never thought I would write one book, let alone three. <laughs> and I never thought I would actually be on TCM and, and a host, even though that was a goal of mine. I never thought it would happen. Do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I mean, that's definitely how I feel. So it's affected my goals in that I now have list to think about what I want to do next. Really, it's all cherry on top, you know, ice yeah. and cake, whatever, whatever, uh, metaphor you want to use um or added you want to use. done everything happens now i'm good if it all ended tomorrow i would be fine because i'm so happy with what i've done and now my only goal is to try to um uh, restoring old theaters my whole mission and goal in life i feel is to uh, preserve help to preserve classic films and classic cinema and classics any way i can do fantastic but it's it's all great now i think if if, I, if it ended tomorrow, I would work in a bookshop or in a movie theater, and I would be very happy. Oh, that's so good to hear. And it's always, I mean, you were talking about these books being a trilogy. Do you want to do more books? No. No. <laughs> really? <laughs> writing is so hard. I was writing this book, they never, that before, and I might down the track in six months or a year, yeah. start thinking about a new concept. But it's really difficult, and I think it's all right. I can see the book right, and it's just out of my reach. But that's also a wonderful thing to strive for, and yeah. something that makes it rewarding is that it's that level of hard that it's you all know, uh, but it's not so hard that you can't do it at all. So uh, I don't know. I, uh, right now, I say no. <laughs> you need a breather. <laughs> I'm happy with the happy with the three books. Yes. Uh, but uh, I might change my mind. Yeah. Who knows? Three is a lot. Three is good. That's a legacy. Three is a lot. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in the way you were talking about how you kind of accepted white male cis supremacy early on and sort of developed an awareness of, of how a, a bigger picture, a more inclusive picture. Now, I've noticed that too. But one thing I see is that I catch myself still all the time accepting 
that worldview. Like, it's so powerful. Do you, do you feel like you still kind of fall into that? Or do you feel like you've developed your perspective enough to, to move away from that kind of worldview? As I was writing this, how I was so blind to the gender and racial inequality happening in Hollywood, how much I accepted as a fact that white men were the one movies they and the majority of the material that i was consuming was from a white male perspective and those men have given me a lot in my life i talk about men helping a lot and also uh, an appreciation for film analysis robert osborne is another one who i mentioned although i didn't get to experience him growing up being in australia and, and i completely understand why he's so revered because he is so accessible and friendly and welcomed everybody into watching classic films and he has such a legacy. But I didn't really see or I didn't side of that perspective. And once I started to discover more films by female directors and female critics and I was angry at myself because certainly the work existed parts, but it was there and I could have sorted out, but I just didn't. So um, now I Fast forward a few years and they started to whatever little platform, little way that I could, I it started to change my perspective a lot on film and I still see it today, this sort of trickle down effect. We still talk about Star Wars and then immediately you'd see the pylon from young men feeling like she had no place talking about Star Wars or well, that kind of mentality of very much present in art house and, and indie films world as well. Oh, have you, have you seen every one of Fellini's films? Like you can't talk about it until you do something that women, I see that still in uh, reactions to me and the types of interview questions I get or the way that I'm not always believed. Um, but I do have to always do that, uh, self evaluation constantly discuss that I have or, um, things that I have, uh, thought of as being true and they're not. Um, and yeah. even just today, I was thinking of people want powerful as a woman, say wardrobe wise, they'll put you in a suit, but why should we have to look masculine in order to come across as being powerful? Mm -hmm. So there's always this kind of buy up against and having to look at myself and, and make sure that I don't have those biases. Cause I, I definitely swallowed a lot when I was young. Yeah. Well, and now so now your approach seems so intersectional. Like you, one thing I really like about your books is that you kind of go for the whole big picture. And I've been introduced to some artists because of that. And it's, and it's, a, it's a very, aside from justice and, and fairness, there's this feeling that there's a wider world. So how, how did you, what was your process of, of building that knowledge base and that understanding? How did you come to to be an intersectional kind of critic? Well, I try, like I said, a lot of it to learn, but I firstly, I think watching foreign films when I was younger helped me to start to establish a worldview that different types of pain experiences that I might not get to have, but through film, I could start to have an understanding about. Uh, but I, I really started to see it as I got into the film world, seeing, um, sexism that would be present towards women, but racism as well. And, and how a lot of female critics of color weren't getting the same opportunities as I was affected them and, and, you know, my ability to skyrocket with my career and they, their ability to, to not be, not be given the same opportunities as I am. So all of the conversations that have been happening in the general media in the world, the last couple of years, I mean, even with the Black Lives Matter movement, la in trying to do, needed to educate myself more, especially around American history coming from Australia, mm -hmm. and that I was taking a very privileged position by thinking, but there are ways, it's, it's always, it's a never ending education. Uh, even when I saw the um, documentary, Oh, Disclosure on Netflix by, and it's talking about representation of trans people in media and how that's the first way that many Americans and people around the world get to experience trans people yeah. is fear at trans people. And it made me really take a good look at myself and the kinds of material that I have laughed at in the past and yeah. consider that that's not. So I'm, I'm always learning. I, I try to listen. I try to learn. 
that's one of the things that I love about film and that I find a lot of value in when it comes to classic film. They spur on conversations, difficult conversations, conversations where you don't have the answers, conversations that need to be had, yeah. and research. I always, an aspect of well, sociology that I don't know about and it spurs me to go to my library or go to the bookshop and, and learn and get books. Yeah. That I find incredibly valuable. Just get lost in it. <laughs> yeah. What are you watching these days? Like what captures your imagination with films? What are you excited about? Oh, I love every time I get my assignments from TCM because inevitably there's a handful of films that I get to discover movies for the first time, movies that came out a long time ago. And this is particularly true with TCM Imports where I've seen a lot of the international films that we show, but there is so much more to explore. There's more to explore, more to read, more to see. You, you never reach the pinnacle of film knowledge. Um, but I'm, I'm also been watching a lot of the movies for the Academy Awards. Not that I do anything with them, I'd be more involved in predicting the uh, who's going to win the Oscars and do a lot of uh, interviews about who I think is going to win and the films to watch. I don't do that so much anymore, but I still really love to the ceremony uh, just so I have the pleasure of knowing the winners and, and knowing those films. So it's been wonderful to catch up on those movies. A lot I got to see at the Telluride Film Festival. I was really lucky that I got to go there. The Power of the Dog is still my favorite from last year. Uh, always has been. One of the first female directors I was ever aware of because she's from New Zealand, but we claim her as an Australian. But the Power of the Dog uh, kind of film that demands your attention, that is, as a voice, she knows exactly what she's saying, but she leaves she trusts the intelligence of her audience and she knows that we will be able to read into it as much or as little as we like. And that was the kind of film, having conversations afterwards, every single person who saw it with me had a different idea of what it was about. So we got to have these great debates about what we thought of Bee's character, uh, Kristen Dunst. I mean, it was, it's so fun to get to have conversations and th that kind of film that you're still talking about a week, a month, the kind of film that The Power of the Dog is for me. Yeah, that's a that's a rare kind of film, but it's it's such a treasure. To, and also, oh, just Kristen Dunst, I feel like she's been underrated her whole career. And um, it's nice that she's kind of getting her flowers now. I mean, I think of The Virgin Suicides and... Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. She she was she was a well developed artist so many years ago and, and, and now that people are seeing it I think it's just wonderful. Are there any um any actors out there today that to you embody kind of the power of a classic film star who has that kind of aura? Mm. I think uh Kristen Stewart really does. She is someone who always surprises me with her performances and I know Spencer the film has been quite divisive but in the way that it was an experimental biography or as they say a fable from a true tragedy and how she transformed I mean obviously you could go into the weeds about how much or little you think she whether you think her accent worked or not but regardless of all that to me that performance was beautiful in its subtlety and I kept watching her hands while she was in every shot and noticing the clench and unclench her hands, you know, illustrating Diana's repressiveness and how much she wanted to break out of her box in a very elegant way that seemed to suit the princess. I think it's a, it's a, someone who can transform a lot, uh, but she also has that it factor that a lot of the classic film stars had where she's cool. She's always the coolest girl on the carpet. She rocks Chanel like no one at point of view. She's herself in interviews. And she's compelling to watch. And so in those ways, even though she's an incredibly modern young woman, I can see parallels to a classic film star in that she is completely her own. I just happened to have watched that Spencer this weekend. Mm -hmm. And I agree completely. There was that that is the modern aura that is the same as was in the classic age where where is it's. it's it's a take on a character. She's not trying to impersonate, but she's trying to get the, the essential, essential feel of this person. Yeah. Absolutely. And just seeing where she went from personal shopper to, to this role, the variety she's capable of, that's, I think, another modern take is she doesn't have 
a persona that she stays in, but yet she has that power and, and mystery of the classic film star. To, yes. Yeah, she, she's able to play with so many different facets of her character and I, I like of her own personality that she brings to these now, like you said, played the gamut of characters. I also appreciate the way her and Robert Pattinson from Twilight have made it a practice to work with independent directors who have a so they lend their names and star powers to these uh, directors so that a wider audience get to see their films. And I think that's, um, that's something that I really admire about both of them. They've been so adventurous. Mm -hmm. So we're going back to TCM Film Festival, and I'm just curious to know your feelings about coming back and what you're excited about doing at the festival. Oh, I'm so excited about theme of reunited again that's how it's going to feel like a, a big party seeing the viewers after two almost three years and getting to be in, and not just by zoom getting to be with my co-hosts uh, some of whom i haven't seen since february 2020 i think it, it's really going to have a great atmosphere and not that i ever took it for granted but i think this year especially i'm just going to soak up every moment and realize again it just makes it more apparent is and how special the viewers and as far as um interviews and films i am still getting my assignments so i'm not sure which movies i'm going to be introducing yet but i put up my hand for a couple that i'm excited about watching ben's gonna be doing this interview but it's the opening night film for et i mean mm. on one hand i think wow i'm old that now a movie that came out a year after i was born is classic <laughs> <laughs> while since uh, ET was released, 40 years, and I'm especially hoping that Drew Barrymore is going to be there. Um, I'm not sure if she will or not at this stage, they're still talking to her, but if she is, as you know from my book, a Teenage Life, that I just really idolized Drew Barrymore so much as a teenager that I don't need to interview her, you know, I don't need to have any particular time with her, I just want to say her, and possibly here's a copy of my book. Feel free to read the chapter on you or not. I hope <laughs> yeah. I did you justice. But just to just to have that uh, moment of acknowledgement of like, of yeah, yeah, you really inspired me as a teenager. Yeah, and boy, she's she's got such a deep con she's got such a deep connection to classic Hollywood too, and she leans into yes. that. I mean, yeah. I think it's great and, that and she's been on the channel. Her, like you see in her daily show that she does, she wears her heart on her sleeve. She's completely herself. She's authentic. Uh, she gets so emotionally involved. I, I really think that she has been able to carry on the legacy of her family by speaking about classic films to a wide audience. Yeah, I think she's she's done them proud, definitely. Well, Alicia, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. I, I so appreciate your point of view. Thank you. I, uh, like I said, reading my book, finding some value in it, and talking to me today. It, it means well. You're actually the first person that I ever heard of, non-friend, non-editor, non-family, that got to uh, read my book or, and, and I got to hear from. <laughs> so you were the first reaction that I heard from. So it was a really nice way to ease into that. So I think I appreciate it. Oh, I was like, get me this book. I was way ahead of the game there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you so much. And, and, and good luck with the festival and all your other pursuits. For more information, including details about Alicia's latest book, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. Enjoying the show? Please leave a comment and a five-star review at Apple Podcasts. I appreciate your support. Thank you for listening. This is Kendall Kruver, watching classic movies. Until next time.